this, I'm going to read the first chapter, but before the first chapter is a quote. A gold miner is a liar standing next to a hole in the ground. <laughs> this has been attributed to Mark Twain. Whether he actually said that, I'm not quite sure. Chapter 1. Drizzle fell on the rush hour throng at Gospel Oak Station. Paul Dempster cast his eyes over the deserted platform opposite. There was something about it that bothered him. He'd seen it hundreds of times before, but this morning it didn't look right. The trackside board said one in 125 and level, but the platform... He squinted at it, concentrating hard. No doubt about it, the stippled concrete was out of true. He couldn't help laughing. It was staring him in the face. Only a few centimetres in a thousand, perhaps, but enough to notice, enough to spook any self-respecting mining engineer. If the track was level and the platform sloped, it made sense that by the far end there'd be a step up to the train that could easily cause an accident, because it would be so unexpected. Railway lines and platforms were substantial things, precisely engineered, like mines sunk in solid rock. Mind the step, indeed. <laughs> if you were drilling for, to cut a quartz vein 200 metres away, you had to be precise or you could miss it completely, when you might actually be just a few feet from the mother load. Imprecision means e errors. Errors cost time, time is money. Strange. He'd been using this station for years and it had never registered before. He shook his shoulders, adjusted his coat, pulled his scarf tight. Time he got out in the field again. This desk job was sapping his strength. A distant grinding rumble caused a general shuffling. From beyond the thicket of trackside brambles, five silver-link carriages appeared, slid into the station and screeched to a metallic stop. Like a flock of unruly sheep, the throng surged forward, carrying him on board the packed train. When the doors slid shut, he found he was wedged against the side of the car, next to a big man in a black overcoat and a young woman with scarlet lipstick wheeling an aluminium suitcase. He tried to stand edgeways to give her a bit more room and they exchanged a brief smile. Thursday was always a bad day. Somehow there seemed to be less room when the weather was bad. Let me see the figures, the man in black whispered into his mobile phone. There's always a catch somewhere. Dempster pricked up his ears. That was one of Henry's favourite expressions. The rest of his journey was uneventful. Stratford to Bank on the Central Line, five minutes on foot to the anonymous modern block in Leadenhall Street, just as the sun came out. By the time he walked into the offices of the Mining Gazette, he was expecting a low-intensity day analysing trends in Chilean copper production. Solid ground, without surprises. Colleagues said he knew more about Chilean copper than anyone else in London. His desk was tucked away in a corner behind, beyond two more industry analysts and the advertising people. He would have preferred to be in the other section with the journalists. For a start, it was much better lit. Share scams, mine disasters, spectacular new finds. They always seemed to have urgent stories to handle. Political violence, bankruptcies, suicides. You never knew what was coming next. Mostly a bit younger than Dempster, the reporters were off interviewing foreign magnates or shady insiders every five minutes. Between times, they shared banter with each other, pinned up cartoons of politicians, talked football, made ribald comments about the girls, threw paper darts. It was all very juvenile, really. But then how close did any of them ever get to the day-to-day -day realities of the mining industry, like running a tin mine deep in a mosquito-infested jungle on the Amazon? All Dempster's interviews were done on the phone. Analysts or academics in Toronto, Los Angeles, Johannesburg mostly. He studied trends in what he called the serious metals, the ones the industry depended on, copper, tin, zinc, nickel. After years working in remote places, he'd settled down while his daughters grew up. Now they were teenagers, he was beginning to miss the outdoor life. Could this be the cause, or an effect, of his troubles with Miranda? He hung up his coat and switched on the computer, thinking about copper. Maybe he could wangle another trip to Santiago. It was five years since he was last there. Would Jameson sanction a week, a week in the sun? <coughs> there was a yellow post-it note stuck on the screen. Jameson wanted a word. Dempster stood up, stretched his arms, clicked his knuckles and sauntered along the corridor. It wasn't going to be a very hectic day. He'd assess the boss's general mood before saying anything about South America. Ah, Dempster, just the man. Coffee? 
Sorry? Dempster's earlobes tingled. Jameson never did coffee. You've heard about our problems, I know. Uh, our problems? Jameson was a pudgy, unpredictable man with a bad complexion. Dempster doubted if he'd ever been down a mine. He didn't look healthy. There were rumours he wolfed chocolate biscuits on an industrial scale when his door was shut. Jameson stood up, grimacing as if suffering a chronic pain in the gut. Only then did Dempster notice the shiny new Gadgia executive model espresso maker in the corner. Jameson plucked a sachet from the polystyrene punnet, clamped it into the top of the machine and pressed a button. Within seconds, a dark rivulet was dribbling into the smallest paper cup Dempster had ever seen. Grasping the brimming vessel between index finger and thumb, Dempster set it down on the desk in front of Dempster. Uh, Jameson set it down on the desk in front of Dempster, like a veiled insult. Sugar? No thanks. Jameson pushed a computer printout towards him. Now these are the latest figures. Ignoring the coffee for a moment, Dempster scanned the top sheet. Then Jameson's face. The man's eyes flickered and his lips creased into a fatuous smile. Dempster had a sinking feeling in his gut. His relationship with Jameson was irredeemably tetchy. The board met last night, Jameson said. It sounded rehearsed. It took a big decision, a unanimous decision, after a lot of debate. I, uh, if you see what I... He gave a desperate cough and his eyes popped as if he had a fishbone stuck in his throat. He struggled to pull a large white handkerchief out of his trouser pocket, then wiped first his mouth, then his eyes. You see, <coughs> we've got to compete with these damn websites. Economies are required all round. <coughs> the printers have been told as well. Uh, not my preference, of course. Hadn't he just said his deci the decision was unanim uh, unanimous? Dempster stared straight at him, ready for anything, or thought he was. So... Why wouldn't the man look him in the eye? Everyone's affected. We're to be downsized, reduced. The whole thing's going online, Jameson spluttered. I'm afraid <clears throat> we shall have to let you go. Dempster felt as if he'd just been punched. He searched J Jameson's face, but he could see there was no chance of actual eye contact. Jameson gabbled on, but Dempster had stopped listening. He felt an almost irresistible urge to pick up the miserable man by his lapels and throw him out the window. Of course, he should have seen it coming. He clenched his fist, turned on his heel and walked out. He didn't want to hear another word. If they were getting rid of him, why go on toadying to the boss? Back at his desk, he stared at a metal pen holder. Copper is God's blessing. A souvenir for the last conference at the Universidad de Chile. His computer screen was winking at him. No, he wasn't up to facing his emails or any of his colleagues. He needed a serious cup of coffee not that miserable paper thimble festering in Jameson's office. He'd be just like Jameson to leave it there all day for the cleaners to deal with. He pushed his chair back, walked round the corner to the staff kitchen. Someone passed and said, Hi, Paul. He gave a non-committal grunt, took his personal private eye mug off the rack, poured some coffee from a Pyrex jug, added the contents of two sachets of demerara sugar and one of dairy creamer, grabbed a spoon and stirred furiously. His hands were shaking. Taking a couple of deep breaths, he lifted the overfull mug, tipped a top inch into the sink and set off back. It took all his concentration not to add in his stains to the carpet as he negotiated the fire door. He sat down, took a mouthful of coffee and closed his eyes. After a time the caffeine kicked in and he sat up, logged on and opened his hotmail account. A blinking light indicated an email from Jameson with three flat red flags. He had one week's notice, paid to the end of the quarter, no energy wasted there, the bastard must have prepared it earlier, and sent it the minute he'd walked out of the office. He could call the union, try to fight it, but what was the point? At first he could think of nothing but the unfairness of it. Only last week he predicted the rise in spot nickel, and some of the others frequently quoted him, our senior metals analyst, whenever copper or zinc was in the news. He never missed his deadlines was always there when needed. And besides, mining was in his blood. How could they think of sacking him? By rights, he should be the last one to leave. He gazed towards the open plan area and wondered who else was for the chop. Of those he could see, only a few, the, few of the desks were occupied. They hadn't all gone already, had they? No. Charles was in Paris, 
and a couple of the others were at a conference on mine safety. Maggie from accounts passed by. She had a hunted look as if she was close to tears. He tried to give her a smile, but his face wouldn't work. How many others were there? He hadn't noticed anyone else coming from the direction of Jameson's office, and certainly he wasn't going round to ask. He would finish his summary chart showing the last ten years of copper production, then start getting his things together. He took a quick look at the other prices cr scrolling across the screen. Gold was up again. Extraordinary. It was nearly 50% from a year ago. Just like Henry had predicted. No getting away from it. He'd been right for the first time in his life, poor chap. This wasn't the moment to fret about all that. He switched his phone to automatic. Mr. Demps is not available. Please leave a message with your name and telephone number. And set to work. Chile had suddenly got much further away, and even more inviting. By lunchtime his frustration had turned to cold fury. He strode four blocks away, entered a pub near Moorgate, where no one would know him, ordering, ordered smoked salmon sandwiches with a pint of Guinness. Well-heeled city types were drinking champagne at a nearby table. They seemed to be in high spirits. He picked up fragments of the conversation about gold strikes in Asia. They were talking about the Philippines, somewhere that was two hours from Manila, then some names he didn't recognise that sounded like penny mining stocks. He began to regret his choice of pub. There's something about gold traders he'd always found distasteful, giving themselves airs as if they were some sort of superior beings. He made out the words 10 million ounces, which was followed by some animated backslapping and general supping. When they loudly ordered a fresh bottle of Verve Clico, he moved to a table further away. He finished his lunch and walked down to the river. The tide was falling fast. He watched a string of three barges making heavy weather of moving upstream. But their apparent doggedness encouraged him. He watched until they finally disappeared under London Bridge. When he did finally get back to his desk, he was in a more upbeat mood. There was the beginning of an idea germinating in his mind. Perhaps things weren't so bad after all. He'd never intended to stay as long as this at the Mining Gazette anyway. He shoved the Chilean files back in the filing cabinet, picked up his coat and went home by bus. It was starting to rain by the time he reached the flat. He turned on the television with the sound down, went to hang up his coat to dry. He phoned for a stuffed crust pizza with anchovies and carizo, poured himself a, gla a glass of coat de bone from a bottle he'd opened the night before, sat down to watch the evening news. The film report was from Africa. A miserable stream of women and children straggled along a dusty road away from huts burning in the distance. A truck full of heavily armed soldiers passed going the other way. It reminded him of a copper mine he'd had to close down in Central Africa during a confused but brutal conflict. The sense of desolation etched on the faces was so familiar. It felt like a playback of his own memories as the refugees struggled soundlessly past the camera. His supper was delivered by a young black motorcyclist in a North Face Arctic jacket. Addressing Dempster as captain, he earned himself a tip. Dempster cut the pizza into eight sections. The wine, dark, fruity and well-rounded, had already eased his mood. It was Miranda who'd first introduced him to fine wine. He could have done with that special smile of hers just at this moment. Fat chance of that, he thought mournfully. How was he going to tell her? More to the point, would she really care? He'd just finished his first slice when the phone rang. He let it ring. Did he really want to speak to anyone before he'd finished eating? Only the family, one or two friends, had the number. Whoever it was would surely ring back. It rang for so long, he knew there was only one person it could be. Dad, I need some money. Viv. He could see her shaking those mauve streaked ringlets truculently at him. I thought you had an allowance. Dad, please. Have you asked your mother? She says we're to ring you. That was Miranda all over. Where's your sister? Is she with you? I'm asking you. Her voice hardened, as it often did. You're responsible for us. He'd heard, he'd heard that before. I promise won't swear at you. How do I know that? All right, how much do you want? At least she was being more or less civil, and her voice had softened now. Usually her tongue was even sharper than her elbows. Her sister couldn't be there with her. Alison tended to steer clear of Viv when she was in this sort of mood. Quite right, too. Fifty quid? Seventy-five. And I need new jeans and money for this festival. Huh? What festival? 
Mind, body and spirit was all he could think of, and Miranda's damn stall at Ali Pali, with the group Blue Crepe and her sortilegious goldfish. Fifty will have to do. Dad, will you be in later? Say about ten. Amazing what money could do. Peace would cost him, and it would only be temporary benefit. At some point, he would have to break the news that he had no current income. All in good time, he said to himself. Viv, my dear, where are you intending to stay tonight? If you see me at ten, how are you going to get back home? I thought perhaps I'd take a cab. He allowed himself a desperate smile. Was everyone on a faster track than him? He took another mouthful, savoured the tang of anchovy as he chewed it. Things could be worse, he, he reflected. Just, he'd just completed a telephone conversation with his elder daughter without a row, an achievement in itself. Was that a good sign or a bad one? After finishing most of his pizza and the glass of wine, he sat down at the computer and opened his personal account. At least there was one member of the family he wasn't at odds with, his younger daughter, Alison. He'd been suggesting they text, she'd been suggesting they texted each other rather than use email. I don't like this protective text, he joked. It gets things wrong. It's like inferred ore reserves, not to be counted on. So for the time being, they were communicating by email. Dear Ali, how's school? Did you get picked for the project? Please call. I don't have your new mobile number, and I don't like to ring the house, as you know. Kisses, Daddy. His inbox had a dozen messages. His sister had sent a long message worrying about her two boys' progress at school. He crafted a sympathetic response and hoped he'd seen them all soon. Then he switched to the internet, marineconservancy.com. He clicked on favourites, Angelique. There was nothing since he'd checked last week. She could be anywhere, from St Kitts down past Martinique, even out in the ocean. He looked at the dates. It was nearly a month since the last fix. He tried to picture her out of sight of land, gently cruising about in the tropical waters, moving at a leisurely pace, munching the odd jellyfish, drifting with the tide. She would be all right. Whatever disasters, emotional or financial, occurred on land, out on the ocean, all was serene. You couldn't even detect a tsunami as it passed underneath. Such peace. No one would find you. Then he remembered... Hurricanes? He looked at Martinique meteorology, felt a good deal better when he saw there was no bad weather forecasts. Reassured, he closed everything down, switched off the computer, went to bed with the wasp factory.